born and raised in that uh, country. And my grandparents came from Spain. So uh, I do have an affinity and love for that country. Uh, now, of course, Cuba is very significant in, and it's been a very keen interest to many European countries, even here in North America. Uh, the United States has, uh, throughout the, the history, has tried to, uh, not annex, but try to buy Cuba from Spain as far back as Thomas Jefferson. And just about every president during the 1800s, uh, at some point or another, had made an attempt to negotiate a deal with Spain. And uh, now, uh, of course, Christopher Columbus uh, landed on the shores back in 1492, and it was in Spanish dominion hands for uh, a little over 400 years, with the exception of a few months that uh, England had uh, conquered it and had, during one of their wars, they took control of uh, Cuba and some of the Spanish dominion islands in the Caribbean. However, Cuba was a very predominant island and port outside of Spain. It was the it was the seat of the viceroy ship uh, for all the all the uh, colonies throughout the Central South America and here in the United States. As you know, Spain controlled most of the uh, Florida and Southern United States all the way out through California. Uh, so it was a very important. It was an important trade port uh, for for the sugar and tobacco and uh, and many products, including it was also a big slave port for trading port as well. Uh, so Cuba was a very important hub for the Spanish crown. And of course, they brought in much gold and silver uh, into Europe and into Cuba as well. Now, the two maps I, I point here, one of the earliest maps uh, drawn of Cuba is the one on top, uh, the 1639 map. And the one on the bottom, uh, is, it's, it's one of the later maps. However, it was the first map that uh, we see being printed up with the actual Cuban flag on it. Now, in Cuba, uh, the earliest known lodges or Masonic activity that we know of come from a Irish military lodge, uh, which was chartered, uh, number 218, which was chartered uh, for that regiment of foot. And as they traveled through different stations and different battles around Europe and around uh, the Caribbean, uh, they traveled with that warrant. That warrant was issued in uh, 1750. And of course, uh, when that regiment uh, took control and the English took control of Cuba in 1762, uh, they actually brought that charter with them and actually had Masonic fellowship and Masonic communication in the island. Uh, I, from, from their records, after speaking with the Grand Lodge of Ireland, it doesn't seem like they actually uh, made any Masons, but well, nor they had the authority, but they had the authority to meet uh, as, as a lodge. Uh, and again, they met in a, in a convent, an old monastery that belonged, uh, named San Francisco, and that's where they actually met in Havana. Uh, do we know? And there's a small article that was printed below, uh, and this is from the, the the known minutes that exist through the Grand Lodge of Ireland, and it's signed by the Master of the Wardens and the Secretary of the Lodge. Uh, that on this day, given the hand, of, uh, they met in Havana on the 3rd of May in 1763. So it, they didn't do much, and of course it wasn't a permanent uh, chartered lodge, it was wherever the regiment went. When the regiment was sent back to, to Europe, then the charter went with them. Now, Cuba, in, in its islands, besides the, the brethren that we know of as early as 1763, uh, the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania chartered a lodge back in 1804 on December 17th called the Temple of the Theological Virtues Number no. 103. And interestingly enough, Joseph Serenu was his first master. Uh, now, this was a, uh, a Frenchman. Uh, we all know him very well as being uh, one of the founding leaders of the Scottish Rite as we know it today. And that part of the yeah. mother Supreme Council in Charleston, and then later on the Northern Masonic jurisdiction. So, at a, for a short period in his life, he was living in Havana, Cuba. And while there, uh, he reached out with many of his French brethren to ask Pennsylvania to charter him a lodge, which they did. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that shortly after this, he was forced out of Cuba by the Spaniards uh, and came here to Charleston and then eventually to New York City. And then, of course, he brought the Scottish Rite with him. But he is considered one of the individuals first brought Scottish Rite from the Caribbean into the Caribbean up here into North America. Uh, and we know that Joseph Serrin was a very important person. I mean, there was a lot of issues with him and he was doing degrees. And, uh, you know, he, he tried to form his own uh, Scottish Supreme Council. Uh, but nevertheless, he was a very prominent man. Uh, and. The important contacts about what he did in Cuba uh, would later come to fruition as what was called the Great Masonic Conspiracy, because his lodge that he chartered there, although he never uh, continued 
quite extensively past that first year, uh, that that seed that was planted was the first independence battle that Cuban uh, members of, of the Lodge and Cuban people actually fought to try to rid themselves or separate themselves and independentize themselves from Spain. And this happened because of that Lodge that met there from Pennsylvania. Now, this is the actual charter, uh, which is still in the hands of the uh, Grand Lodge of Cuba. It's in their, uh, on display in their beautiful museum they have in their Grand Lodge building. Uh, and again, it's just uh, the caption just reads in Spanish that uh, this was the original charter, chartered by the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania on that particular date in 1804. Now, Cuba is no stranger to independence, persecution, oppression, slavery. Uh, if they've been, it's been a mix throughout the 200 years. Uh, they've had many battles and many fights. Uh, but the interesting thing about Cuba is that Cuba was actually uh, one of the few places in the world where independence and plans for independence, plans for revolution were actually hatched and concocted in a Masonic Lodge. And not just because they used the building, but it was a Masonic Lodge, it was a tiled meeting by Masons who came together to orchestrate that first coup independence and create the first uh, statutes and constitution of Cuba, which would later be adopted finally in 1898. Now, the great Masonic conspiracy as we know it uh, is dealt with Joaquin Infante, who was a member of that early lodge and a, and a good friend of Sever Joseph Severnu. Uh, and he was also a very close friend with other revolutionary Masonic leaders, just like uh, Trussant Leo Vichur, Francisco de Miranda, Simon Bolivar. Uh, and he actually met these individuals. He traveled around. He had their, their Masonic fellowship. So he was very inspired by the movements. Uh, but early on, they formed a meeting to discuss the possibility of creating a coup or a, a fight for independence to liberate Cuba from Spain once and for all. Uh, and again, that was hatched in a Masonic Lodge during that tiled meeting of that first lodge that was chartered by the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, which has been dubbed the Great Masonic Conspiracy because it's one of the few known instances that we know of documented as proof that this actually happened by Masons in the Masonic Lodge. Now, during this time, they also uh, required the help of Jose Antonio Aponte and Jose de la Luz y Caballero and Brasaba Cardenas, several individuals who were also members of the lodge. Now, Jose Aponte was a mixed Creole. He was half black, half white. And he organized many of the slaves and many of the people of color and Creoles to come together and fight in this planned revolution and the planned war of independence. However, it was quickly put down. The insurrection was squashed. And unfortunately, most of the uh, insurrectors uh, fell to the hands of the Spanish crown and suffered uh, execution at their demise. Now, Jose Alponte, because of his status and his position, uh, he actually died in the gallows on April 9th, 1812. And the head, his head was cut off and displayed in an iron cage in a particular corner or a street corner in Havana, Cuba, which is today according to their history, is the actual location where the Grand Lodge building was built. According to documents, they said they chose that spot in honor of this individual, and there is a plaque outside the building commemorating what this individual did. From that point on, throughout the entire history up until 1959, all the battles that were fought in Cuba for independence, to get rid of oppression, to get rid of slavery, uh, for freedom, for, for civil liberties and civil rights, were all led by Masons. I mean, they were really, really hands down, 100% Masons. Uh, if you see the picture on the top left, uh, there's a group of individuals, all Masons meeting, supposedly outside of a, of a building or a lodge uh, to discuss their plans going forward. Many of these individuals actually met in lodges and discussed these plans while in lodge and while with other Masons themselves. Now, all the names you see here are all predominant leaders. Of course, there was a lot more. Uh, but Jose Martí is considered the father of the Cuban nation. Uh, Tomás Estrada Palma is considered the first president of the Cuban Republic. Narcisio López created the Cuban flag. Perucho Figueroa was the person who created the national anthem, uh, and so on and so forth. Carlos Manuel de Cepeda was the leader of the first, the second independence, which was in 1868, which lasted for 10 years and, of course, uh, failed to overthrow the powers of Spain. Now, again, in 1809, just prior to that, the, the, the leading of that revolution, 
uh, Jose Francisco Limas, Jose Maria Herrera, and Ramon de la, Ramon de la Los, uh, all Masons, met in the Lodge to form uh, a particular group that was go going to be affiliated with Masons and actually use the same tactics as a Masonic Lodge. They were going to have signs, they were going to have grips, they were going to have special passwords and codes. Uh, and, and it was kind of following the rituals and the hierarchy of Freemasonry. And these individuals banded together to create this order, uh, which was named Reyes y Soles de Boulevard, after Simón Boulevard, which is literally saying the rays of the sun in honor of Boulevard. Simón Boulevard, the revolutionary leader in the, in the South American hemisphere. Uh, they adopted a flag. They adopted their code. Uh, and again, it's th these were all Masons acting in Masonic Lodge, preparing to enforce and, and revolutionize this force to be able to try to overthrow. Well, of course, it was short-lived. Uh, but again, this was one of the first steps. Why it was called the Great Masonic Conspiracy because of what these individuals conspired uh, in a Masonic Lodge. Uh, and as they created this group to mimic Freemasonry and use the, the, the procedures and, and hierarchy of Freemasonry to kind of formulate this group so that they wouldn't be tagged as Freemasons. They'd be able to say, well, this was the group Reyes y Solas de Boulevard were independence, freedom fighters fighting for our independence from Spain, but technically they were all under the, the guise of Freemasonry. Now, the current Grand Lodge of Cuba uh, was created in the, on December 5th, 1859, and it was first dubbed the Grand Lodge of Colón in honor of Christopher Columbus, and this was done in order to conceal the Masonic practices established on the island. Uh, they initiated and, and chartered three lodges, Fraternidad, Prudencia y San Andres on December 27, 1859. Currently, uh, I spoke with the Grand Master just before the holidays of Cuba, and he advised me that there are 322 Masonic lodges in Cuba and roughly about 25,000 members. They are split up into 16 provinces, each with a district deputy Grand Master, and there are about 100 districts under those 16 provinces. Most lodges operate in the Scotch Rite, but there are four lodges which use the York Rite. Currently, there are 116 working lodges in the city of Havana. Now, the interesting thing about Cuban masonry is that they meet every single week of the year with the exception of one week in May, commemorating their birth of independence, or the War of 1898, and the holidays during uh, December and Christmas. But other than that, they meet 50 times a year. However, they do it a little bit differently. Uh, so if you have four meetings a month, one meeting is for degrees, one meeting is for business purposes. One meeting is for programs and education. And the fourth meeting is for benevolence, which they take a lot of pride and, and, and emphasis on. Uh, so technically, you can say that if, they're, if they meet 12 times a year, it's 12 degrees, 12 business, 12 programs, et cetera, et cetera. But they don't do the same work every week of the month. It's prescribed work as they do it. But they do meet 50, at least 50 times uh, a year, which is quite a bit. The document you see here is the original uh, Grand Lodge Charter, uh, which was issued uh, by the Grand Lodge of South Carolina, along with many other lodges that were chartered by Louisiana, uh, the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, the Grand Orient of France, who had many lodges chartered in Cuba. Uh, that It's a little bit frayed and old and delicate, but it's still, it's still on display there in the Grand Lodge uh, Museum of Cuba. Now, Cuba does have several appendant bodies. Uh, in, in, in terms of uh, side events similar to like Daughters of Acacia, which is very similar to the Eastern Star. Uh, they have age restrictions, their, their ladies wear white, uh, and they also help uh, the, the, the Masons in philanthropic work uh, throughout the island and throughout the, the extents of the uh, Masonic community in there. Uh, now in their height, they actually had expanded into Central and South America. So there are many countries in Central South America who actually adopted and, and were granted charters to have daughters of Acacia. Now, of course, during the years, of the, the later years after the revolution of 1959, many things kind of fell by the wayside, but masonry for the most part continued on. Uh, a lot of it is coming back today. And of course, this organization is, is, back, is dated back to the 1930s. And currently there are 16 lodges in existence in Cuba. Uh, and they're constantly growing. They, they are, they are, uh, masonry in Cuba is growing by leaps and bounds on all, on all levels. Another interesting group is the Association of Veterans Masons of Cuba. Now, they're not 
considered, if you hear the topic, they're not veterans of any war or, or any battles. The, this is an organization that was created and adopted uh, back in 1893. Uh, and when it was chartered, it was to uh, honor Masons who have given an uninterrupted service of activity in a Masonic Lodge or the Craft Lodge in Cuba for more than 20 years. Uh, if After serving 20 years of, of dedicated service, uh, you could be inducted into this organization. Uh, and it's very, very prestigious and it's very active today. Uh, and when the Grand Lodge of Cuba, uh, the session, when they meet their annual meeting, the only two individuals or the only that receive uh, or receive standing is the Sovereign Grand Commander of the Supreme Council and the Dean of the Meritorious Association of the Veterans of Cuba. So it's really, really prestigious there, but again, has nothing to do with military purpose. Uh, it strictly deals with uh, 20 years or more of undedicated uh, dedicated service to the craft of masonry in Cuba. Now for the young uh, uh, brethren and the young men of Cuba, similar to de Malay, uh, the Grand Master was trying to explain to me how it is and they kind of have this terminology they call the youngings, which is an order for the young men of Cuba called youngings. That's what he called it. But uh, it's very similar to de Malay. Uh, and again, it's hoped that by uh, influencing them and exposing them to the craft of masonry and, to, and, to, and being, being uh, led by masons, and, and, and organized by Masons that eventually they would become members of the Craft Lodge. Uh, it is also growing throughout the uh, country and it's hopeful that one day de Malay will eventually make their way. That's their, their hopes is that one day de Malay will make it into Cuba uh, for the first time. They've never had de Malay there. The other interesting thing is the Masonic Home. Our Masonic Home has been around for quite some time since the late 1800s. Uh, and it was a little bit different the way we term Masonic Homes here. Uh, here we have brethren that will move in and pretty much living here. In the earlier days, there was brethren who were indigent and didn't have enough money to uh, live in a place, uh, and we'd offer a home for these for these brethren. Uh, now, like New Jersey, you can actually buy a home, you can buy a condo, you can buy a townhouse, which is a little bit different. Uh, but the one in Cuba was designed to help beggars, homeless, poor people, indigent people, masons, non-masons alike. Uh, they would bring them in, they would house them, they would feed them, they would give them spiritual help, medical assistance, and hopefully, it was a revolving door. They didn't want you to stay there for life. They would prepare you for the future and, and, and bring you back on your feet and hopefully readmit you into society and become a productive member of society. Because of the lack of funds during the revolutionary time and, and Castro's time, uh, monies were short. So the, the place fell into disrepair. And in 2001, it was kind of condemned uh, because it was inhabitable. It wasn't really worthy of... of, uh, of taking care of people. It was a pretty run down and need a lot of money and, and help. However, the Masons have come back. They have put a lot of money and effort into it. Uh, they're slowly rebuilding the entire campus. Uh, and right now they can easily assist about a hundred elderly Masons and their families. Uh, and if a family has to come move in together, they can accommodate two to three person families in what they call casitas, which means cottages in Spanish. Uh, and these are designed to hold a family unit. So you're not in, in a large dormitory type section, but you have your own little home that you can call yourself, uh, you can call your homestead uh, until you get yourself back on your feet. And eventually it is a revolving doll. They don't want you there for life. Uh, it's meant to assist you, to aid you. And then once you get back on your feet, you move on, opening another position, opening for someone else in need again. And again, this goes to members and non-members alike. Now, one thing that they are proud of is that they're uh, Academy of Higher Masonic Studies. Uh, and this was, again, uh, organized uh, by the Cuban Grand Lodge uh, and it, back in, 19, uh, in 1949. And it was designed to bring education and programs to the lodge. Instead of just doing bills and just making masons, uh, they realized the importance of Masonic education as we're doing here tonight. Uh, so the brethren can present papers, can present uh, Masonic topics. Uh, they can have debates. They can have all kinds of issues there. Uh, and this is really predominant in Cuba right now, and it's really something that they really enjoy, and it's expanding throughout the whole nation of Cuba. Now, the Cuban Grand Lodge building is very, very unique, very nice. It's uh, about 11 stories tall. At one point, it was the tallest building in Havana, Cuba. Uh, and, of course, during the revolution, after Castro took over, uh, the, as in all uh, government buildings which, which fell into the hands of the government, uh, X amount of floors had to be allocated for the Cuban revolutionary government. Uh, so if you walk in a building today, as I did two years ago, 
Uh, the first two or three floors belong to the Grand Lodge. And then you got about four or five floors that belong to the government of Cuba. And then the upper floors where the Grand Lodge room is and the, the offices for the Grand Lodge and the museum are, are back are still in their hands. Uh, now, they were very proud of opening up their National Masonic Museum, which opened up in 1955. Uh, to this day, they're still very proud of the artifacts that they have there. Uh, and they try to open at least every day, Monday through Friday, for a few hours in the afternoon. If the brethren are available, it's all on a volunteer basis. If they're available and they can make it there. Uh, if you're traveling and you give them advance warning, they will definitely be there for you to open this lodge and give you a tour. They're very eager to show this building. And and then, I mean, I've, it has fallen in disrepair and it needs money and it needs a lot of assistance. But uh, again, in its heyday, it was a magnificent building. And I have no doubt that in the future will be again. And it displays many wonderful artifacts, including all the accoutrements, aprons, and Scottish Rite regalia from Jose Marti, who's considered the father of the Cuban nation. Uh, the stuff that he actually wore there is in, in, inside there on display in the top right-hand corner. Uh, the flag on the bottom was the flag that was draped over his coffin when he passed away. Uh, so again, there's a lot of wonderful historical artifacts here, a lot of it dealing with American masonry too. Uh, now, the key thing is that when Castro took over in 1959, if you all remember uh, the movie Godfather 2, uh, when Michael Coyle is, you know, they, they, they're at the celebrating New Year's and the coup takes place. And when they go outside, everybody's smashing things and breaking things and hotels and casinos. And they're literally running for their lives. Uh, well, that's pretty much what happened. I mean, there's a lot of that is true what happened in Cuba at that time, uh, especially anything dealing with American interest. If they had a, an American company, an American business uh, that was all taken away uh, with a lot of hatred and anger towards it. But the curious thing is that when you walk into this museum through these glass doors and you walk down this hallway, to the left and to the right are busts of famous Masonic revolutionary leaders. Uh, and there you'll find the busts of Washington, you'll find the busts of Franklin, you'll find the busts of Abraham Lincoln, uh, American patriots. And inside you'll find a lot of American memorabilia and archives and antiques and Masonic regalia and stuff, uh, which was kind of left alone. The building was not touched uh, and none of these statues were defaced. Uh, if you if you go back to the Bolshevik Revolution of 1918 in Russia, uh, anything dealing with the with the royal family, the Romanov family, anything dealing with with the Orthodox Church, uh, all that was smashed and destroyed. Uh, statues of Lenin, Lenin came up, statues of Stalin came up. Uh, but again, in Cuba, you don't see that. They, they actually kind of left masonry alone, even though they were displaying great American leaders. They kind of left it alone. They did not bother with it. Now, in Cuba, there were appendant bodies. Uh, they did have Royal Arch. They did have Eastern Star. They did have, uh, of course, they had the Royal and Select Masters. They had uh, the, the Commandery. However, after the revolutionary uh, coup by Fidel Castro in 59, most of these went by the wayside. And by 59, most of them were pretty much gone. Uh, however, Scottish Rite and Craft Masonry are the only two working Masonic bodies in Cuba. Uh, and they have continued thus far and are very, very strong and very prestigious there in, in Cuba. So it's very well in, in high in demand. And I'm and speaking with many of them, including some brothers from the eastern end of the island who are trying to actually work uh, to bring Royal Arts back into Cuba. So I have no doubt eventually that it will it will come back. Now, the Cuban flag has is very unique. Uh, it's interesting because. Uh, the Cuban flag was designed by Narciso Lopez, but it was designed here in New York City. Uh, it was flown first here in New York City, and it was designed specifically with Masonic overtones in mind. I mean, it was designed almost like a Masonic flag. Uh, and all the years looking at it, I even as a Mason, I never realized uh, that when you turn the, it upright, it actually represents an apron. And it was designed to mimic a Master Mason apron. As you see the triangle, it was to have an all-seeing eye, but they decided to go on a five-pointed star, which also has Masonic overtones. But the entire uh, flag was designed with Masonic overtones and Masonic uh, uh, issues, Masonic uh, details with it. Now, this first flew in New York City on May 11th in 1850. Uh, Moses Y. Beach, the publisher of the New York Sun, which is a, uh, a publishing company in, in Lower Manhattan, it first flew the flag over that building. 
And he had to write an article because people were wondering, what is this flag flying over the top of this building? Uh, so the newspaper had to write an article uh, to explain this to the readers of the strange flag. High above the flag, high above is the flag of free Cuba. There is a flag which will sooner or later float over the morrow. Now the morrow is a castle at the very far end of the entrance of the port to Havana, which is still there today, built by the Spaniards. Uh, and 11, eight days later on May 19th, 1850, uh, for the first time, Brother Larcisio Lopez carried the flag into battle and landed on Cardenas, Cuba. So again, it's interesting that this flag uh, was not only made and designed in New York City, flown in New York City, uh, and of course, it was ent entirely developed and designed with masonry in its, in its hindsight and the ideals and principles of masonry. Now, because of the Cuban flag, there were other flags that were inspired as well, uh, each by revolutionary leaders of their own right. Puerto Rican flag, the flag of the Philippines, and the Catalan separatist flag uh, as well. These were all inspired by the Cuban Masons, the Cuban Patriots, and the Cuban flag. Uh, and each individual led that revolution there. Uh, Bertanzas led the revolution in Puerto Rico, who worked hand in hand with uh, Cuban Patriots. Uh, he was a Freemason himself. Uh, the father of the Philippine people and the nation is Brother Rizal. Uh, and he was the father of that nation, and he also led that independence. Uh, and the Catalan separatist is a part of Spain which incorporates Alicante and Barcelona. Uh, and for about 100 years, they've been trying to separate themselves and become a separate uh, country of Catalonia. They're still trying, but for the most part, it's kind of weighing down a little bit. But they have their sentiments about that there. And as traveling to Barcelona last year, uh, the year before, I, I, uh, you can actually still see remnants of that there in, in Barcelona, Spain. But again, these three were all inspired. Uh, in their own right because of the Cuban flag. Now, the Cuban National Anthem was created by Pedro Felipe Figueroa, uh, and he was a patriot and fought in the Ten Years' War starting in 1868, uh, and he wrote the El Himno de Bayamo in 1867. Uh, he was captured during the war and executed in 1870. His daughter, Candelaria Figueroa, became a hero of the uprising by carrying the new independent Cuban flag into the Battle of Bayamo in 1868 to commemorate the Battle of the Ten Years' War, the second time that they actually tried to fight for their independence in Cuba. Now, the interesting thing is that here in New Jersey, our grand jurisdiction during this time in the, 18, in the middle 1800s actually had chartered lodges and given them permission to work in their own native tongue. So we had uh, German lodges, French lodges, Spanish lodges that were actually working in their own native tongue uh, for immigrants that were coming in from these countries in particular a lot of immigrants who were coming from Cuba during that time. Now, of course, as the immigrants died off and, and, and weaned off and their heirs grew up and, 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 and moved away, English became the predominant language. So slowly but surely, as the years went on, the individual languages were spoken less and less and eventually kind of died off. Uh, but in 2018, uh, we elected our first Hispanic grandmaster, uh, native born of Cuba, most worshipful Roger Pintana. And he went to many of these clandestine lodges that were meeting in New Jersey, who were the sons of exiles or those who had fled Cuba and were still here. And he decided that he wanted to talk to them and say, listen, if you, if you don't want to have ties with Cuba or you can't because of, of, the, rebel, of the communist regime and you can't be in contact with them, uh, he organized for these individuals to become Masons for the Grand Lodge of New Jersey, providing uh, he had asked me, did New Jersey at one time grant permission to lodges to speak another native language other than English? I said, yes, they did. Uh, so keeping that in mind, uh, the Grand Master chartered five new lodges, four Spanish speaking lodges, one Portuguese, and we they are working on an Italian one. Eventually, hopefully we'll have an Italian lodge. Uh, so just like the 10th, Man 10th Manhattan district in New York City, which has about God knows, over, over half a dozen uh, lodges working in different languages. Uh, here in New Jersey now, you're allowed to work in those languages. And one of the first lodges that was chartered was in honor of Perucho Figueroa, the individual who gave his life for the freedom and independence in Cuba and came, created the Cuban National Anthem. So one of the lodges here in New Jersey is now named after him. And that's one of the first uh, clandestine lodges that was brought in and made uh, a mem members of our Grand Lodge. Now, as I said before, throughout the history of the United States, uh, starting from Jefferson on, on the way down, uh, 
uh, to William McKinley, almost every president had an interest and Congress had an interest in taking uh, control of Cuba or annexing Cuba, uh, not forcefully, but actually by way of payment. Uh, now, the Platt Amendment was introduced by Orville H. Platt, also a, a Mason. But all these individuals here, William H. Taft, William McKinley, Theodore Roosevelt, all had particular a hand in these amendments and, and, and trying to annex Cuba or had a direct presidentship while the Spanish-American War was in effect. Now, Theodore Roosevelt, we know, led the Rough Riders up San Juan Hill in the eastern part of uh, Cuba. Uh, but the Platt Amendment was introduced in 1901, and this was kind of to uh, govern how America would control Cuba and annex Cuba uh, once we won the war, you know, of 1898, we won the Spanish-American War, we finally did win, and we took possession of the Philippines, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. That's why Puerto Rico today is still a commonwealth of the United States. Philippines eventually was given its independence as well, as did Cuba. Now, the governance of that, uh, along with the Teller Amendment, which kind of laid out how C the United States would interfere with Cuba. They did not want to rule Cuba. They wanted to be able to have Cuba have its own independence. However, we became Cuba's protectorate. And just like in World War II, when the Japanese surrendered, we became Japan's protectorate for a while. They decided that they would no longer have a, a military force. So any attack on Japanese soil or on Cuban soil during that time would be considered an attack against the United States, and we can intervene and defend them. That is also how we acquired Guantanamo Bay, the naval and marine base, which is still in occupation, occupied by the United States today. And why Castro can never uh, engage that or try to take that by force because it would be a declaration of war against the United States. Uh, but again, Henry M. Teller put forth the Teller Amendment, uh, and this kind of laid out how Cuba was to be uh, given its independence and how slowly the United States would relinquish its, its existence there and give control over the island to those to the Cuban people. He was a sovereign Grand Inspector General, uh, and he was also the Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Colorado on two occasions. Now, it's an interesting quote uh, that wrote Henry M. Teller wrote, which really smacks of masonry to me, because uh, as Masons, we come from many jurisdictions, uh, but every jurisdiction is different, and every jurisdiction handles its own uh, rules and bylaws and how they deem fit on their own. Uh, so masonry really doesn't stick its nose into how every organization should be and how we should all do it together, but everybody does it differently. And this influenced what he wrote here. Uh, I can never do better than now when the American flag has come down from Cuba, but better still, a flag for Cuba has gone up. The American flag is the best flag in the world for Americans. It is not the best flag for men who do not want it, it is not the best flag for Cuba. Cuba's flag, not representing a hundredth of the power and glory of ours, is the flag for Cuba. And when the Filipinos shall put up their flag and ours shall come down, as I believe it will do someday, will it be a better flag to them than ours can be? Although you may administer your government with all the kindness and all the wisdom which humans are capable, the best flag is the flag that the men themselves put up. It is the only flag that ought to command the admiration, love, and affection of the men who live under it. And it is the only flag that will. Liberty-loving men will never have any love for a flag that they do not create and they do not defend themselves. And I think that's really prevalent how that uh, smacks uh, as masonry as uh, we consider ourselves all independent and, 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 and regardless of what jurisdiction we come, we have something that binds us together, but yet we're all different. And we have to respect our individuality and our diversity around the world. Now, we come to the part of the current revolution of 1959 with Fidel Castro. Now, there is many myths and many stories as to what happened uh, and, and why masonry was allowed to progress and continue in this island. Now, Cuba is particularly interest to Masons because Cuba is one of the few nations where Freemason was prescribed by the Spanish and allowed to, even though the Spanish crown was practically under Catholic regime and Catholic rule, 
uh, of course, where the Catholics were banned and forbidden from becoming Masons, but also that it was continued to flourish even when the introduction of Marxist communist dictatorship, Freemasonry prevailed to operate. Now, Fidel Castro was a very wealthy man, came from a very wealthy, educated family, and he uh, was very a great speaker. He was a great orator, a great speaker. He was a very intelligent man. Uh, and he felt that Cuba was selling itself abroad, and, and especially to America and other countries, and we were selling the country away and not, and not protecting the interest of Cuban people first. So his first attempt of throwing the Cuban government, overthrowing the government, was on July 26th of 1953, which is considered the M26-7 movement when he tried to overthrow dictator Fajenzo Batista. Now, Fajenzo Batista is portrayed, again, in the movie Godfather 2, uh, as he made actual deals with the mafia here in the United States, where they were operating freely without recourse or any any uh, uh, inter interruptions by the government or, or the FBI or anybody they can run freely, providing, of course, that Batista got his fair share of the profits. Now, that coup was overthrown quickly. Uh, he was sentenced to jail for about a year. Then he was he exiled to Mexico. And in Mexico, he began to rebuild again, as many of the earlier patriots in Cuba had done before. Now, he, he sailed across from Mexico to the eastern mountains of the Sierra Maestra Mountains in Cuba. Uh, there on the Granma, which was the name of the ship. And he landed in 1958. Uh, but again, when he landed there, uh, he was kind of overtaken, and he had to literally run for his lives. Now, one of the greatest myths and stories comes out is that a lodge, pictured the one below, or one similar, uh, gave him safe haven. While he was running for, a life, for his life to regroup, Masons uh, assisted him, they aided him, and they gave him safe haven for him to regroup with his leaders and his, his members of that movement, and again, proceed further, which eventually he did. Uh, but again, uh, it's very strange that in a communist country, we see Freemasonry. I'm not going to say it was flourishing in the public eye, but it was still doing very well and it was still operating. Now, there are other stories that Fidel Castro and his brother Raul became Masons, that Fidel Castro uh, uh, was very close friend to Father Angel, who was a, a famous landowner, uh, and he was affiliated with Masonry as well. Uh, there was another issue that said that his best friend uh, from, I believe it was from Chile, uh, Salvador Allende, uh, was also a Mason and inspired him. Whatever the case may be, Freemason was left to flourish on the ground. Uh, and, and it was left to continue without interruption from the government, as in most communist countries around the world. Now, my personal view is uh, that regardless of all the stories, we know for a fact that Cuban Freemasonry was allowed to continue to flourish in Cuba up until the present day. And with the death of Fidel Castro and his brother taking over for a short time as president, uh, from that point on, Masons of Cuba are now again in the limelight. Uh, they're involved in parades, they're involved in marches, they, they publicly, openly uh, go to meetings. It's no longer a, a threat. Uh, they're, they're gaining momentum, they're gaining strength, they're gaining numbers. Uh, and I have no doubt that in the next couple of years, they will be up to the numbers that they really didn't have before. Uh, but my personal take on why this actually happened, uh, and I think realizing that Castro was a smart, intelligent individual, a great speaker, a great captivator of, or, of, of an audience. Uh, and just like the Nazis did in World War II, their propaganda is what turned a lot of people. So rhetoric or not, it was their speech making, it was their propaganda, it was their way of motivating these crowds into their fold, into thinking and doing what they wanted. Now, when Castro took over, he never removed any of the founding fathers of the nation or their history. Now, if you look at the Bolshevik Revolution, they kind of separated that past, especially when it came to royalty. You know, they started a new life, a new, a new leadership with a new future, dealing with Marxism and Leninism and Soviet country. Uh, so it almost started brand new. They kind of separated their past. Here in Cuba, Castro left the people's patriots and forefathers intact. He never removed that. 
Now, one reason I believe personally is why that happened. It's because I believe that Castro knew the power of Mesro. He knew the very influence of how Mesro can influence people. And he realized that every time for the last 200 years, when Cuba was oppressed, when it was enslaved, when they didn't have civil liberties and civil rights, when they were trying to fight for their independence, every single time, Masons rose up to the challenge and put their best foot forward to try to implement change in that nation. All these leaders became our Benjamin Franklin's, our George Washington's, our Thomas Jefferson's for them. And they realized, he realized that in his own mind, if I take away their history, if I take away these people, these patriots, and more importantly, if I subdue masonry, as it was tried to be done in the past, masons might one day rise against me and overthrow me. There's a clear pattern in history in Cuba of risings and uprisings. And every single time it was led by Freemasons, orchestrated by Freemasons, and many times orchestrated in a Masonic lodge in, in Cuba. He realized, I believe in my own, this is my own estimation, that he must have realized the power and the influence that masonry held over these sway over people. That if I remove this, they're going to come after me. So better off, leave them alone, letting them work on the ground. As long as they're not on the public eye and public view, I'm not going to go after them. I'm not going to censorship them. I'm not going to remove them. I'm not going to, uh, you know, imprison them. Let them continue. Now, there are rumors that throughout the decades, Castro had spies in there when men that were made Masons and they were allied to spies, to Castro and the government, they would feed information to back to the government. And that minutes of the meetings had to be sent to the government so that they can see what was going on. Uh, of course, I don't doubt that didn't happen. Uh, but again, if someone is a threat, if someone is something you fear, why go so far as to have spies and read their minutes, which could be different than what actually was spoken in the lodge, uh, but why not remove them altogether? So his best bet was to keep a short leash on them, or at least keep an ear of what's going on. So if there is a semblance of some sort of uprising, he wanted to hear it first from those brethren so he can make changes and, and make sure that it did not happen or find the solution to calm them down. Uh, and, and again, if, if there is a, a group that is a thorn, most communist countries remove that group altogether. Uh, and again, this is something why, me personally, is the reason why Cuba Mason was left alone and why Castro turned a blind eye to it. He didn't publicly advocate for it. He didn't publicly stand up for them. But it was, if you do it and I don't hear about it, you know, so be it. I'm not going to come after you guys. And I believe it was, in fact, because of the influence that Masonry had over the centuries and what they had done, him fearing himself, just like he overthrew a government and plotted a coup, easily others can plot against him and over, try to overthrow him. So, and I think that's one of the reasons he was left alone and Masonry was left alone there. Now, patriotism or conspiracy? The one thing which stands out in all the history of Cuban Freemasonry is the persecution which the Brethren had to undergo through as a result of their belief. Changes have been made that these brethren conspired against the government. Uh, you know, charges have been brought up against them. Uh, but did not many American brethren conspire against the English government in the early history of our own country? Do we condemn them for having so conspired? Washington, one of the chief conspirators, has become the father of our country, honored and respected because he stood loyal to an ideal. Shall we condemn these early Cuban patriots for doing the same thing? To fully express what Freemasonry represents to the Cuban people, suffice it to say that without mentioning it once, twice, or even a thousand times, one cannot write the history of Cuban culture or the Cuban struggles for freedom without Freemasonry. We should honor and remember those brave men of Cuba who inspired by their Masonic beliefs and freedom and equality for all men, never strayed from their ideals and following in the paths of so many other revolutionary leaders and fellow Masons who fought for freedom and who carried out their Masonic ideals in doing so. Uh, brother, and I have no doubt that that is one of the reasons why Cuban masonry has allowed to prosper and is doing so well. Uh, and point in case, one of the symbols of Freemasonry in Cuba is the Grand Lodge building of Cuba, which stands 11 stories. It's a pillar of the, of the city. It's a, 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 an ominous art deco structure. Yet when you walk into the front 
into the doors, into their massive foyer, there are two massive portraits, paintings up on the, on the ceiling, on the wall, on the walls as you walk up the massive staircase. Both these paintings depict many revolutionary leaders prior to Castro. And every single one of those individual faces, which is recognized, there are a lot of faces that were drawn just as fill-in, but all the faces that you see there recognized are all leaders of the past, patriots and fathers of the nation, and every single one of them was a Freemason. Now, suffice it to say that uh, many of these individuals had dealings with America, were inspired by American in revolution, and again, they were allowed to flourish. These paintings have survived the revolution coup of Fidel Castro during those years. And to this day, it has survived untacked and unscathed, as was the entire building inside, which kind of gives you an idea of how powerful and influential Freemasonry was in the island of Cuba to the people. Uh, now, to this day, uh, it is still a very prestigious order, and it is looked on that way by the people because of its association with their history of oppression and freedom and slavery and their forefathers. They know that history. When young Masons or Masons become Master Masons in their communities, once they do so, members of the community come out in full force, in parades, uh, they, have, they have parties, they have celebrations to honor that person's induction or inclusion into that fraternal order. That's how powerful this organization is. These are the local communities throughout the country of Cuba that they, they come out to honor and congratulate these young men or these men becoming Masons in their lives because now they represent a part of that legacy of that history of the Cuban people and the Cuban past, which they're very proud of. This is the current Grand Lodge of the Grand Line of Cuba. Uh, Ernesto Zamora Fernandez, he is, uh, they served three year terms. This is his last year. Uh, they will re-elect a new, a new line at some point this year. Now, New Jersey, New York has also had a very keen relationship with uh, Cuba. Uh, the Grand Lodge of New York has had uh, recognition with Cuba uh, for many, many, many decades, way before uh, Castro. Of course, when Castro took over, things were a little bit tight because they could not communicate so readily easily, but uh, they've always kept relations. And as you see in the picture to the left, uh, that was the immediate past Grand Master, uh, Lazaro Valdez. And he met us here in New Jersey and New York several times. And the individual to his left is Most Worshipful Roger Quintana, who became the first Hispanic or Latino Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of New Jersey. And he uh, granted those charters for those Spanish and Portuguese speaking lodges here in New Jersey. And now when the Faustino Lazaro came to visit uh, one time about uh, four years ago, uh, there was a, there's two Spanish lodges that operate in New York City on the Grand Lodge of New York. And they came together to honor and host uh, the Grand Master and his, and his entourage to have a, a, a meeting and a, and, a, and a banquet there. Uh, and when the Grand Master spoke, which he gave his, his lecture in Spanish, he made, ish, he made a, a, a proclamation and a, and a, 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 a kind of an, a message of, of needing support because the brethren so much love the craft of masonry and want to present themselves and attend in proper attire. But the lack of suits, the lack of ties, the lack of aprons, the lack of collars and jewels. Most lodges in Cuba, usually the top three officers are the only ones that are dressed and attired completely in Masonic regalia. Uh, and some lodges, only the master is wearing an apron and a collar and a jewel because they don't have the means. Uh, of course, they don't have the money, but more importantly, they don't have access to buying these items. So as he was telling the story, I got up and I took my tie off, my cufflinks and my tie clip, and I handed it to him. I said, Grand Master, this is my favorite tie. Uh, and I openly give it to a brother in Cuba for their use any way you see fit. Uh, and before the end of the evening, every brother in that lodge had given up every tie, every cufflink, every, every uh, tie clip. A brother gave his shoes. I don't know how the hell he got home, but he, he literally took his shoes off and gave it to the Grand Master. And, and it was literally a, a, a sign of, of solidarity and support and love and fellowship uh, when his grandmaster had to buy two extra suitcases just to bring home all the extra accoutrements and, and clothing and Masonic regalia that was given to him by the brethren. And again, this is a special uh, a, a moment that, again, regardless of the fact that we couldn't even communicate with each other, or I mean, at least I could, but others could not, 
that masonry ex- goes beyond that that culture, that creed, that color, that that language barrier, and still that mystic tie brings us together, regardless, even if we understand each other or not, or the fact that we came in a different way and manner, as all Masons do. But that is the beauty of, of our craft and our masonry. Uh, here is just some small uh, pictures of the Grand Lodge uh, Museum in, in, in Cuba, in the Grand Lodge building. You see the bust of Lincoln, uh, which survived the revolution unscathed. It wasn't, it, was, it wasn't marked, it wasn't chipped, it wasn't destroyed. Uh, to give you an idea of how powerful these images are to the people of Cuba, that even during the revolution, uh, which America was the focal point, and 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 Cuba and Castro vented their anger towards, uh, still allowed this lodge and this building to survive intact with many Masonic overtones, especially dealing with America. Uh, the picture to the left on the bottom are two brothers, uh, especially Brother Victor, uh, who's a 33rd degree and actually uh, has come to New, to New Jersey and to the United States quite a bit. He actually came to Rochester uh, several years ago when I was coordinator of 33rd and, 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 and was there to support me. Uh, and when we went to Cuba uh, in 2019, he actually orchestrated the, the move together. When we went there, we, uh, me uh, and many members uh, of co-workers of Port Authority, on behalf of my wife, there's about nine or 10 of us that always gather together and we travel somewhere around the world together. Uh, not Masonically, but I'm the only Mason, but we all workers or co-workers, some retired, some still active. And we always take a trip somewhere around the world. And we decided to go to Cuba. Uh, the cruises were now opening up. And in May of 2019, we decided to book a cruise uh, from, from Florida to uh, Miami and some other islands. But we spent 36 hours in Miami. And just to give you an idea of the openness and the willingness and the, and the love and admiration these brethren are willing to give, even though they don't have much. Uh, when I was social media and, and, and on, on and, and putting posts and stuff, he we talk a lot, and he said, "Mo, when you get to Havana, don't buy any packages or any excursions through the cruise ship. They're too expensive, and they're too time limited." He goes, "Come with us, and we'll take care of you." I said, "Well, brother, you know I appreciate that, but I do have a party of nine people. You know I don't want this to turn into a Masonic trip because everybody here is not a Mason." And, you know, everybody's got their own ideas of what they want to do and where they want to go. And I don't want to impose myself on, on someone else's holiday or vacation. Uh, but I'll mention it to them. If they want to do it, then so be. Now, he offered uh, for us to have uh, a bus. And we all were taken with them. And we were, for 36 hours, we were with them. Now, we started looking at some of the excursions in Cuba, and just to do the famous Tropicana Club, it was $200 per person. It was me, my wife, and my nephew. So it would have cost me, my wife, and my nephew $600 for me to buy three tickets for four hours. And that included the trip there and the trip back. Uh, these brethren charged us $125 for the driver who had a, a, a large passenger van, uh, and we had the run of the mill. It gave us 36 hours from the time the cruise the docked to the time it was gonna depart. We were with them the whole time. Of course, that was peanuts because part of that $125 also included the four-hour package at the Club Tropicana with dinner, seated at the front, front right by the stage. They actually got us to dance on the stage. Uh, they were flowing rum and all kinds of beverages, and the cigars were just rolling down the table. Uh, so everywhere we went, these brethren really went out of their way to make our stay special. Uh, they gave us a tour of the building. Uh, they even asked us that if you wanted to exchange Cuban American money to Cuban money, which you legally had to do, don't do it at the terminal, but do it here at the Grand Lodge building because we'll, they charge us at the bank 1% as opposed to 13% at the terminal. So again, they just were willing to, to really, really go out of the way and make us feel special. Uh, the top picture is the Grand Lodge office and all the brethren that work in the Grand Lodge office there, the Grand Secretary, the Grand Treasurer, and many of their staff offices. Uh, they have a tough time because money is an issue. The building needs a lot of repairs and needs a lot of money to do so. Uh, of course, the government doesn't help out. And they're also trying to save all their artifacts and their proceedings and their minutes. Uh, they're trying to transcribe them and, and eventually publish them and digitize them so that it could be available to all the brethren. Some of them are very old and very fragile, and it just can't be handled on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, they took us to the roof, and they gave us a beautiful uh, uh, oversight of, of old Havana and Havana itself from the roof of the building. And you see here is the old Cathedral of Havana, which dates back to the, the early 1500s. 
of course, no trip would be the same if it didn't take us to the famous Floridita bar, where the mojito and the daiquiri were first created, and where Ernest Hemingway sat in the corner. You see there, there's a live bronze statue of Ernest Hemingway, where he would sit on a daily basis or several times a week, drinking his mojito, uh, coming up with ideas to for his next book. Again, they took us to Ernest Hemingway's home. They took us to the cathedral. And everywhere they took us, they had some sort of connection and allowed us to just go beyond uh, the measures that they were allowed. Uh, they took us to the famous Botiquita del Medio, which is a famous spot in Old Havana where many celebrities around the world have come over the ages and decades. Uh, and, the, and the neat thing is there, the history is that you write your name on the board outside. Of course, tens of thousands of people just keep writing their names over and over. But that's the... The, uh, the famous history of this bar that everybody, famous celebrities come here and famous people come here and they write their name there. So somewhere on that wall is Team Badger, which has probably been erased by now, but I left my Team Badger mark on there. Uh, when we went to visit the home of Ernest Hemingway, uh, they opened the doors and the windows, but you can't walk into the building. You can only peer in and look and take pictures. Uh, and I wanted to check out his, his office. So the brother Mason hearing me quickly went off to the side and talk to whoever he had to talk to. And the next thing I know, I was granted permission to walk throughout the entire house of Ernest Hemingway, including his main office here, which you see me taking a selfie, where on this desk he penned some of his greatest Pearl Supplies winning novels. Uh, and again, at the behest of these Masons who just opened the doors for us everywhere we went, including ending the evening at the Tropicana with dinner and the front of the table. Now, if you ever watched the movie Goodfellas, uh, there's a part where Ray Liotta and Lorraine Bracco are parked the car across the street and they enter the club through the kitchen, through the back door. And she's wondering why we're entering through the back door. He goes, ah, who wants to wait online? line? And of course, he's a well-known made man in the, in the mob and he's given access through the back, given the table in the front. Well, literally, I felt like Ray Liotta that evening because while the lines were quite big out there because there was three cruise ships, each with at least 5,000 people on board, all tours were waiting outside. The brethren quickly whisked us in through the back. We went through some of the doors. We went through the loading dock. Next thing you know, we're out in front of the stage. Nobody else has come in yet. They bring us right to the front of the table. Several of those individuals working there were Masons themselves. Uh, they brought us up on the stage to dance with the dancers. Uh, and then uh, the, the, the amount of cigars and liquor that was put on the table was just phenomenal. And at the end of the night, there was a brother who went through all the tables and collected all the cigars which were given to all the, you know, many tables had cigars. If you can buy them, you can get them. Uh, a lot of them were in glass tubes and he would collect them all. And he literally came with a bag of over a hundred cigars. Not to mention I had three boxes on my table that were donated there. Uh, but again, I, I, I took them and then I gave them to the brethren who were in the, in the van with us. I said, listen, disperse this amongst the brethren of the lodge, uh, give the liquor to the brethren of the lodge, let them enjoy some fellowship with it because it's just too much for me. I don't drink, and I, I'm not going to take this all back home with me. But again, uh, the connections we had there were, were, were fantastic, including visiting the Havana Club, the Plaza of the Revolution, uh, which was built before Castro in honor of the father of the Cuban people and Brother Freemason, Jose Martí. And again, you see that this statue and this monument was never defaced. It was never deviled. It was never uh, torn down. Castro kept their history intact. He realized that removing Jose Mati, a brother Freemason, would be very detrimental to him. And I believe that's why all this is allowed to stay, including their capital, which is a complete small replica of and scale to the U.S. capital here in the United States. A symbol of democracy here was replicated in Cuba uh, during the early 1900s. Uh, and for many, many decades, it had been unused for what it was intended to as the seat of government for Cuba. In 2019, they were adding the final touches of restoring, uh, restoring this building to its proper prominence the way it had before. And eventually, in 2020, all of the president and the parliament and members of, of their, uh, of their uh, government, seat of government, were going to go back into this building. And this was going to become the hub and the center for the capital uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the leaders, uh, the government leaders of Cuba. So it's, it's nice to think that you know, slowly but surely they're coming back, hopefully open up completely one day. But on the final day, uh, the brethren decided that they were going to invite us to meet at the pier at eight o'clock in the morning. 
And I told everybody, well, he, they got something special planned for us. I don't know what it is, but he came down at eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, and there, when we got there, uh, the brother had the brethren had rented uh, several cars, antique old cars predating uh, the revolution of 1959. I was in a 1921 Ford convertible. It is the oldest registered car taxi in Cuba, in Havana, Cuba. Uh, and I was riding around for four hours with a top down smoking cigars, visiting all the greatest sites and, and beautiful spots in Cuba, uh, visiting the land of my, for, of, my, of my parents and my forefathers. Uh, and again, it was just magnificent time to be riding around like that uh, and touring Havana uh, open air. And this was all at, at the courtesy of these brethren who put it all together and just did a fabulous job in making us feel so special. And not just me, but my entire entourage, which was nine of us here, none of which who were Freemasons. Now, brethren, uh, I do believe that masonry is very influential. And by that, I mean that it's very important how we conduct ourselves in lodge and outside of lodge. And also the fact that masons and the influence of masonry is very important. And I say that because masonry throughout the years uh, has been a very influential part of people, governments, and masons themselves. I believe, again, that the influence of Freemasonry is what kept Freemasonry alive during some of the darkest periods of Cuban history from 1959 on down. I think that's one of the reasons why it, it survived. I think it's one of the reasons why it has stayed there this long. But it's very important that every Mason act accordingly inside of a lodge and outside of a lodge because it's very, Masonry is so influential and it can be used, when it can be used properly, it can be very influential to bring others into our fold, but also earn the respect and admiration of many others, even non-Masons, as the people of Cuba feel towards Masonry themselves, even though they're not non-Masons. Now, people will ask me, Brother Mo, you know, in a lodge, we're not supposed to practice religion. We're not supposed to practice the politics. We're not supposed to uh, choose sides. Why did these Masons in Cuba or Masons, for that matter, in many parts of the world, especially when it came to revolutions in, in Italy and in Hungary and France and in South America and the Caribbean and, and here, our own revolution? Well, brother, and I believe that although we should not discuss politics and religion, we should always keep the peace and harmony intact of a large and especially of our community. And I believe it's incumbent upon every Mason that when a wrong is being done, that they should stand up to reverse that wrong and particularly standing up for those who cannot stand up for themselves. Now, the famous writer and poet, Edmund Burke of England writes, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And I believe that this goes to the core of Freemasonry. Freemasonry's primary principles are that we are a fraternity that is diverse, that is tolerant, that accepts men of all color, men of all religions, men of all faiths, men of all creeds, men of all cultures and customs. And I believe that's what makes us so special. And that's what makes our fraternity so special. And I believe that when the peace and harmony in a lodge or even outside of a lodge, in a community, in your nation, in your part of the world, has been threatened or is being threatened, I believe is incumbent that Masons should stand up and fight and defend for those rights. Defend to keep that peace and harmony of your land, of your country, of your people, of your lodge. Now, again, you're supposed to respect the laws of which country you belong to. But again, I do believe that throughout the centuries, Freemasonry has been a beacon for those whose freedoms, civil liberties, civil rights, and peoples who have been oppressed has been a beacon for those people to liberate them, to fight for them, and stand up for them, and to stand up for the very rights that allows men and Freemasons to meet in a meeting. Again, if we don't have that luxury and we're not free and independent, then we lose the right to meet and we lose the right as Freemasons. And I believe that's one of the reasons why Many, if not all, of the modern revolutions were led by Freemasons, in particular in Cuba, and why Cuba has allowed and has prospered masonry uninterrupted, some years less, some years more, but again, it has been allowed to continue its, 
it, its presence there in Cuba, even during its darkest times uh, of, of Castro's regime there. So, brethren, uh, may God bless all of you. May God bless the United States of America. May God bless all our veterans, past and present, all our first responders and healthcare workers. Because it is by their sacrifice that we meet here today as free men and Freemasons. And most especially, may God continue to shine his blessings on the greatest fraternity in the world, Freemasonry. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, illustrious sir. Uh, do we have any questions out there? If you can raise your hands and unmute yourselves, we'll, we can see if we have any questions answered. I do want to be respectful of your time. Uh, brother Freddie, I saw your hand up first. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for a very good presentation. I was in Cuba on 2019th as well, and I attended about four lodges. We confer a second degree over there in English to a Canadian as well as to a Cuban. And their hospitality is unbelievable. Uh, unfortunately, they couldn't really afford um, festive board afterwards. So we usually take them out to the bar and have a drink. And just a reminder, if any brethren is going to visit the Grand Lodge building, make sure you don't wear shorts. No shorts allowed up there. Thank you. Yes, you must dress accordingly. There are some restrictions there with it. But uh, uh, please, if you do go, do reach out to them because they, they really are willing to go out of their way to make you really feel at home and very hospitable and very kind. And, uh, and also, if you can, bring bring what you can with them because they are in need of regalia. They are in need of aprons. They are in need of some simple things that we uh, take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, and if we need something, it's a quick phone call. It's here. Uh, so uh, when I went down again, I bought, I bought some extra ties. I bought some aprons with me. Uh, everything helps. But, uh, but again, you'll have a great, wonderful time. I know uh, when President Trump, in, in, in shortly up two weeks after I went uh, in, in, on my trip in 2019, he kind of closed the borders and relationship again. You can still go, but it's a little bit more difficult now to go. You have to meet certain criteria. Uh, cruisers are not allowed to go there again. Uh, so hopefully in the future, things will open up because the the brethren were benefiting from the fact that more Masons can openly, freely travel to Cuba, especially from America. Uh, it, it's a little bit rougher now again, and it's, it's closed up again. But hopefully in the future, things will, will get better because, uh, you know, Pulling politics aside, the people are suffering. The people need help. People need money. People need, uh, and the brethren need do need every assistance they can get their hands on. But thank you, brother. I, I'm sure you had a great time. <laughs> Any other questions for illustrious brother? That was a fantastic presentation. So thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to ask our sovereign grand inspector general, uh, illustrious brother Al Jorgensen, if he had any remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Brother Jeremy, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Brother uh, Gomez. Uh, again, a tremendous presentation uh, and had the benefit of being able to uh, uh, be with you on a number of other occasions when you've uh, made presentations uh, on, on uh, this particular platform. So thank you very much for gracing our, uh, our, our Valley's uh, attempt to uh, provide education to the members and appears from uh, what I'm seeing on the screen that we do have representation from all across the state of Washington. So you, uh, you made quite a, quite a presentation this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.